to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 18. We welcome you today to our study of the magnificent book of Colossians. As we mentioned earlier, Ephesians, as we mentioned in our previous lessons, Ephesians complements the idea of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, while Colossians emphasizes the Christ of the church and they beautifully intertwine with these wonderful messages. We're so glad that you joined us for our study today and we want to encourage you to locate your Bible as we're going to be looking to the Word of God in our Bible study today. Friend, we want you to know that these lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to visit their assembly. Uh, they'd be happy for you to sit down and study the Bible with them. If you've got a question about maybe what must I do to be saved or want to learn more about the church or, or any Bible question, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. You will be an honored guest at any of their assemblies, and we encourage you to check out the church in your local area and visit them. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. Our emphasis and our main goal is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We're concerned about souls, and that's why we bring these lessons as we do. And friend, we want to encourage you to check out our website. It's uh, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can locate all our resources for Bible study, whether it be video lessons, audio lessons, written material, study questions. Uh, we've just got a host of free Bible study material that would no doubt help you in your journey to know God's Word better. Friend, if you'd like to know more about God's plan of salvation or, or anything, we'd love to visit with you about that. You can contact us uh, from the information given at the end of this lesson, or you can log on to our website and do that as well. If you'd like to have a copy of our lesson, those are always available free of charge. Uh, just write to us, email us, or call us, and we'd be glad to help you with that. And in the day and age in which we're living, uh, we want to encourage you to visit your Apple Store, the, the Apple Store, the Google, Google Play Store, and download our app. That's a great way to study the Word of God in a world that is moving very, very fast. All right, let's direct our attention to the book of Colossians. Colossians is such a magnificent book in that while some people in this book are getting caught up in other things. Philosophy, ideas and teachings of men, Paul emphasizes the preeminence of Christ as the head of the church and head of our lives. As we mentioned, the book of Ephesians emphasizes the, the church of the Christ, while the book of Colossians emphasizes the Christ of the church. The main idea is the preeminence of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you can see that in a couple of beautiful verses. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 teaches us that in all things Christ might have preeminence. There were people that we're going to study about in this book who were elevating other things, human wisdom, philosophy, doctrines and teachings of men. And Paul basically says, no, 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 those things aren't what needs to take first place in your life. Christ needs to be preeminent. And then, as we notice in Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10, He should be preeminent, for in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. He is the exact image and representation of God. He is God in the flesh. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21. And so we're going to think today about these beautiful ideas from the book of Colossians. Now, here's kind of just a brief overview of where we're going. In chapter 1, we see that Christ Himself is preeminent. In chapter 2, we will notice that Christ's doctrine 
is preeminent. His teaching ought to take first place over all other teachings. We then notice that Christian living should take preeminence in our life in chapter 3. And finally, Christian friendships are preeminent in every way, as we're going to see in Colossians chapter 4. All right, let's then turn our attention to some of the background that is causing some of these messages and problems that are arising. There was a, a heresy or a false doctrine that some of the people here were getting caught up in. And that doctrine really had four elements. It dealt with the philosophies of men. And, and some of these philosophies were denying the all-sufficiency and preeminence of Christ. That's why Paul will say in Colossians 2 verse 8, don't get caught up in these uh, vain philosophies of men, rather put your hope in Christ. And so some are saying that Christ isn't everything that you need more than Christ. You need our philosophy. You need wisdom from our Stoics. You need to go to our schools and listen to the sophist and the wise people there. And Paul says, no, no, no. Christ is all in all. Then part of this philosophy uh, incorporated some Judaistic ceremonialism, if we could use those words, or some of the ceremonies that people in the day of the Jews used. For example, whether it be the rite of circumcision, whether it be some of their special days, their feasts, their new moons, you'll hear Paul mention these ideas. And so some are saying you've got to have Christ and then you need to incorporate these uh, elements of Judaism into it. And Paul will again say, no, Christ is all in all. He's sufficient. And then some in the book of Colossians were also uh, bringing in different ideas about angels and, and worship of, or exalting angels. In Colossians 2 verse 18, Paul will say, Angels are not where you need to put your focus. It's on Christ. And then one idea, that, in which in many ways is so far removed from us that we really sometimes struggle to understand it, is known as asceticism. And that is some were saying that the flesh and the body and, and the touchable and tangible is actually evil and of the devil. And if you do anything that feels good or tastes good, even if it's good and holy and right, you've got to deny that. And Paul will say, no, it's, that's not true either, as long as it's used in the right form and in the right fashion. And so these are some of the philosophies that people were struggling with. And Paul is trying to help us see Christ. He's all you need. His philosophy, his life, his teaching, his mindset, and Christian living are the things you need to focus on and not the ideas and teachings of men in the world. Let's turn our attention to some of those teachings. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 5, we notice a very beautiful one, and it's this. If you want to have the hope of heaven, it's only available through Christ. Notice Colossians chapter 1, verse number 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. No doubt these people are concerned about living with God. They want to go to heaven, as we do as well. How's that going to take place? That hope is found in Christ and the purity of the gospel message. We don't need Christ plus something else. We need to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. He's the only source of, of true happiness and peace and all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 verse 3. And He's our strength for everything that we do, Philippians chapter 4 verse number 13. But for these Christians to go to heaven, Paul says, you've got to walk worthy of your calling. You know, you can't just live however you want to live as a Christian. There's a certain way you walk and a certain way you all act and a certain way that we talk. And Paul mentions that. Notice Colossians chapter 1, verse 10 with me. The Bible says this, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. What do we need to do to make sure that our lives are true to God and His Word? I need to make my aim to be fully pleasing to Him. Who is it that I'm concerned? Ask yourself this. Who am I ultimately concerned about making happy? Who is it at the end of the day that I want to know that I've done the right thing? Well, it's God. I want God's approval. 
I want God to be the one who, who is the one who's approving of my life. And so I want to have the mindset that I want to be fully pleasing to the Lord. Friend, I want to, as I walk worthy, that means I want to be fruitful in every good work. That idea, very simply put, means that we want to do everything we can to grow, to mature, and to be as active and involved in the work of the Lord as possible. If I'm going to be fruitful in the Lord's work, that means I've got to get my hands dirty and do what God wants me to do. I've got to take an active part. Christianity is, is not for bystanders. Christianity is for people who are ready to get the work boots on and get busy in the kingdom of God and then to walk worthy of the Lord. I've got to increase in the knowledge of God each and every day. I've got to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 2 Peter 3 verse 18. I've got to study to show myself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. And in every day I've got to try to put to use that knowledge in teaching others the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's another principle that I want you to notice from Colossians 1. And it's a very powerful teaching about what it is that causes Christians to be redeemed. We, we think about the preeminence of Christ and what is it that ought to place Christ on a pedestal for us? My friend, one of the things is Jesus is the one who redeemed me by His blood. I want you to look in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 14. Notice what the Scripture says. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Why should I give Christ first place in my life? It's only His blood and His sacrifice that redeems us. Redeem means to buy back. You see, all of us have sinned, right? Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all sinned if we're of an accountable age. What does that sin do? That sin separates me from God. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2. And because of that sin... I was no longer friends with God. I was in a relationship with evil and sin and the devil. What is it that brought me back? We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Why give Christ preeminence in your life? Friend, it's His blood. When you think about what Jesus did, think about the cross. Think about the sacrifice. Think about those stripes that were laid on His back. Think about how people mocked him. Think about the, the nails that were driven in his hand, how he hung in agony, how he struggled for every breath. Why did he do all that? To redeem me and to redeem you. That ought to put Christ on a pedestal in every person's life. But you know what else gives Christ the preeminence? He's the head of the church. Only the Lord Jesus is identified in the Bible as being the head of the church. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18 with me. The Bible says this, And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. Why does Christ need first place in my life? He's the head of the church. He's the head of the body. I'm a member of that body. If I'm a Christian, I'm a member of that body, and I want to look to Him because He's the, the head of the church, the firstborn from the dead. He deserves that preeminence in my life and yours. Friend, I hope you'll listen carefully to what we're saying here, and we don't mean this to be unkind to anybody in any way. But please realize this. Jesus is the one we need to look to in matters of religion. Listen carefully. He has all authority in heaven and earth. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Can you have more than all authority? Of course not. Who has that? Jesus does. He has all authority. The Bible teaches that He's going to be the one who judges us. He and His Word are going to judge us on the last day. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my Word has that which judges him, the Word that I have spoken. We'll judge Him on the last day. Romans 14, verse 12. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why should I give Christ preeminence as head of the church? His Word is going to judge me. He's going to be my judge. But friend, more than that, I want to give Christ preeminence because He gave His life for the church. Acts 20, verse 28 says this, 
and he church purchased the church with his own blood. Who paid the price for the church? Jesus did. Isn't it a privilege to be saved? Isn't it a, a privilege beyond measure to, 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 to have the Word of God, to know that I can live with God eternally, to, to have the hope of heaven? What makes all that possible? The Lord Jesus Christ deserves preeminence because He's the one who makes that possible. All right, let's then direct our attention to Colossians chapter 2. And I want you to notice that in verses 4 and 5, some people needed to be warned that there were false teachers. These false teachers maybe even had some persuasive words of human wisdom, but that's not where people needed to put their hope. Look in Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Paul says, Now I say this, Lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Friend, Paul makes the warning, and we want to give the warning as well today, that in letting Christ be preeminent in our life, we've got to make sure we're not listening to the wrong voices. There were false teachers during the first century who had what the Bible labels as some persuasive words of human wisdom. That is, they might could twist some words in such a certain way that it almost made it sound like it was truth. And Paul says, wait a minute now, are you listening to the right things? Are you putting your focus and are you listening to what you need to listen to? And friend, there are voices today that are trying to teach and say things that are just not true. We live in a world that claims to be where there's a lot of human wisdom. But are we really listening to the right voices? There are people who carry some pretty big degrees behind their names, who will say that man came from nothing, that we just evolved, or that there was a massive explosion, and out of millions, if not billions of years, man came from nothing to what he is today. Friend, what are we listening to? God created man in his own image. Man was created from God. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 18 as well as Genesis 1 verse 27 and Genesis 2 verse 7 teaches us, hey, let's point our attention back to the right voice, our Creator, who says that we did not revolve from a cesspool of nothing into what we are today, but we are designed in the image of God. And you know, when you think about it, it doesn't take a PhD to figure that out, right? You don't get massive, intelligent, logical design from nothing, do you? I read a writer who once said it this way. He said the idea of evolution or the Big Bang Theory basically would be akin to this. Imagine a tornado going through a junkyard and the end product being a pristine 1957 Chevrolet that works perfectly. What's the chances that a tornado is going to go through a junkyard, pick up every piece, put them together in working order in such a way that you could get behind the steering wheel and drive out with that car? What The chances of that are so slim, nobody would fathom that. Well, friend, the same statistical odds have to be aligned with evolution, that everything by chance is going to work out in such a way that every part depends on the other and somehow this is the end product. No, that's not the voice we need to listen to on matters like that. And so that's one example that we give of some of these things and, and there might be many others as well. All right, let's then turn our attention to some other ideas in the book of Colossians that help us as we study God's Word and as we think about how to live a life in such a way that, that we can really be pleasing to the Father and give honor and glory unto Him. Let's turn our attention to Colossians chapter 3 and I want you to notice a principle here that that teaches us how we must look at the Bible, the Word of God. I want you to look in Colossians 3, verses 16 and 17 with me. Notice as we give Christ preeminence, that also must occur in our worship. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, 
teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now listen to this. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. As we think about this idea of giving Christ magnification, preeminence in our worship and in our life, friend, we realize that to do that, we've got to let Christ's word rule in our lives. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Friend, that does not mean that I can do something, that I can just walk away and say, in Jesus' name, and that makes it okay. No, that's not the idea. What does it mean to do something in someone's name? Well, it means to do it by their authority, their power, or with their approval. For example, a policeman says to you, stop in the name of the law. What's that mean? He has the power to tell you to stop, to make you stop, and to punish you if you don't stop, right? Acts 4 verse 7, the disciples were asked, By what power or by what name have you done these things? To do something in someone's name means you do it by their authority. Listen to Colossians 3 17 again. Whatever you do, now Paul, what do you mean whatever you do? In word or in deed, spoken or action, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, as I live my life, everything I do, I want to make sure I've got God's approval for the language that I speak. Does God want me to talk that way? The actions that I'm involved in, morally, practically, business actions, the way I live my life, does the Bible authorize that? A Christian ought to live every day of his life by the Word of God. Now, let's direct our attention then back to doing that in worship. Colossians 3.16 we're to sing, to make melody in our heart. And the Bible says in verse number 16 again, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. As it relates to worship, must we have God's approval for what we do? Well, sure we do. The Bible teaches whatever you do in word or deed, we're to do by the authority of Christ. God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The truth is God's word, so we want God to tell us how He wants to be worshipped. Well, how does God want to be worshipped as it relates to singing? Sing and make melody in your heart. Ephesians 5.19 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, singing with psalms, hymns, hymns and spiritual songs, singing one to another. Christian music is with the voice. We sing to one another. We can make melody not on a drum or a banjo or a guitar or a seven-piece rock band. We make melody in our heart. How? Paul says, I'll sing with the Spirit and I'll sing with the understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. This is why in the New Testament, Christians use their voice. In the New Testament, as it relates to worship of the church in the New Testament, you never find mechanical instruments of music. Christians always worship God uh, with their voice. The, for example, the disciples in Matthew 26, they sang a hymn and went out. Every opportunity that we see, they use their voice to worship God. And so when we think about letting Christ have preeminence, friend, I hope you'll understand the way we're saying this. But I want you to listen real carefully. It's not about what I want in worship. And in all kindness and honesty, it's not about what you want in worship. We're here to worship and honor God. He's the audience. We're the participants. And friend, God tells us how to worship Him, which means in giving Him preeminence. I want to look to the Word of God, the Bible, on exactly how to do that in such a way that God would be glorified by my life. All right, what else do we learn from the book of Colossians? We learn this as well, that as a Christian, I need to walk wisely and make good friendships in this life, people who will help me to get to heaven. Look in Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Paul says this, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, season with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Friend, as we think about having Christ having preeminence, it's a lot about how I live my life that shows that. Paul says you want to walk wisely toward those who are outside. 
here's what we're talking about. Whether I realize it or not, or you realize it or not, as a Christian, people are looking at our lives every day. Are we walking with wisdom? Meaning, are we living our life in such a way that people can see God living in us and want to be a Christian? Are we exalting the magnificence of Jesus every day? And then the Bible uses the terminology redeeming the time. Redeem means to buy back. And so really the idea here is not that you can buy back time. For once time's gone, it's gone. But it means this, making the most of the time. Are you seizing the opportunity? Are you taking what you've got and the time you've got and using it to the glory of God? And are we always ready to give a good Bible answer for everything we say and do? 1 Peter 3 verse 15 says, Be ready always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and with fear. And so today, friend, we hope that each one of us have been encouraged to give Christ first place in our life. He's the only one who is worthy of that and deserves that. If you're not a Christian, as always, we want to encourage you to become one. Friend, we want you to know the gospel is good news. Jesus came to save men from sin. You will call His name Jesus. He will save His people from their sins. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21. Do you believe that message? Do you, are you really ready to commit to that? The youth, Ethiopian eunuch was traveling in the chariot with Philip. Philip was traveling in the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, as he's doing so, he tells him, he sees in the dis distance water. He says, hey, here's water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Would you be willing to turn from a life of sin, maybe giving preeminence to other things, and turn to God? Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And friend, to have every sin washed away, would you be immersed in water? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And we pray today that each one of us have been motivated to really look at our lives and ask ourselves, who are we giving first place to? And friend, if it's anyone other than Christ, we encourage us, we encourage you to make Christ first in your life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.